Hello and welcome back to the Sales and Marketing Director Incubator for 2023, the program that helps you make great career decisions to maximize your potential. My name is Mike Dixon, Director of the Sales, Marketing and Category Practice for AXR Recruitment and Search. And before I introduce today's guest, let me wet your appetite with what we have in store this year from the AXR Network. Now, we're going to be hearing from some of Australia's fastest growing market makers and disruptors, people like Mooty, Yes You Can, Drinks, Obella, V2 Foods, right through some of the giants of the industry, such as Nestle, Kellogg's, and Blackmore's. Um, we're also going to be introducing you to some guests in some super topical areas like loyalty and revenue, as well as bringing the HR and category perspective. So lots to look forward to in 2023. But let's get to the, into today. Welcome from the world of toys, play, and entertainment. Um, Chris Walker, sales director for Hasbro. Chris, how are you this morning? Very well, thank you, Mike. Good to be here. Fantastic. Well, good to good to see you. And um, we had some, a very um, great good feedback from last year, Chris, and some of the intro questions we're running. And we're going to, so we're going to stick with that theme. And I'm um, going to ask you to kick things off today about your favourite brand. And you can't pick one that you're working on or have worked on. <laughs> I was plenty to choose some in the current portfolio, that's for sure. Um, tough on this. Um, Many different brands, I think, for everybody over the over the lifetime. But but for me, I'm probably going to go back to the world of sport, which is probably my one of the, one of my real passions. Um, and I'm going to pick Nike. Um, mm -hmm. Nike is the is probably one of my favourite brands uh, right up there. Um, it's the ultimate ultimate disruptor. Um, it's a business that's taken huge calculated risks um, as they were coming through um, to to really change the nature of of sport and the whole category, and really change that category from sport more to leisure. Um, effectively to make it accessible to everybody. Um, there's a, you know, how they did things as well. Um, it's a fantastic book um, from the guy who started it, Phil Knight, called Shoe Dog, which is, I recommend any, anybody read if, if they haven't already, just on the trials and tribulations of, of how a small business starts and, and, and how they kind of formulate and make decisions and cash flow challenges and what have you. Uh, but small things like, you know, orange shoe, box, orange shoe box, for example, to differentiate in the back office. Uh, so you can always pick the Nike, uh, the Nike brand out. So yeah, I'd probably go for the Nike one. Now, I was uh, on the way home last night, went past a Nike shop, and I saw a big 50 in the window. Is that, are they 50 years old this year? It must be. Must yeah, be it's it must be around that. I think it's coming up to the 40th one of that, that Jordan thing, because there's a movie coming out, I think, in the right. next week or last week. Okay. I think. Yeah, so it's pretty close. Yeah, right. This has been a brand yeah, new yeah, around yeah. for a while. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, we were um, looking at some of the rooms we have here at AXR, Chris, and talking about the, the thing we have, which... Uh, each room is is themed as a, a a job or career you might have excuse me aspired to as a, as a, as a kid. Um, now, when you were that you know going back yeah. as, as a child, what career did you think you might have had? Well, it probably wasn't this. <laughs> um, if I go back thirty or so years ago, um, look, I, I was very much aware of sales and marketing. My, my 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 father had a small marketing business, so I was kind of aware of the kind of things he did. But when I was growing up, I actually wanted to be a pilot. Um, the best route at the time was via the Royal Air Force, obviously from the other side of the uh, the world. Um, I, so I went to officer selection training and um, got through three pretty tough days of that and then failed the fourth and final interview. So I didn't know enough de detail about the all of the RAF bases, et cetera. So a bit of a bit of a gut wrench at that one after three, four days there to actually uh, fail that. So um, um, in fact, effectively, I was thinking, well, what next? I'd always wanted to travel. That was part of the reason I wanted to be a pilot to travel. Um, and so I went backpacking for a year. Um, I lined up um, one or two other jobs before before I left and deferred a, a program with Boots uh, before I left. So, uh, see, so yeah, I went backpacking. That's when I kind of had my first experience of Australia uh, and sort of fell in love with Australia. Fantastic. Um, funny enough, I I almost became a pilot too, but uh, um, my uh, I, I failed because my, my I'm completely colourblind, <laughs> 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 which I kind of knew going in. I thought they might they might not pick that up. Well, they find the they find things like that out for you. Yeah, they find out every single single sort of weakness that you might have. Yeah, well, they really enjoyed my colourblindness. They actually sent me to very different medical centres to test just how bad it really was, and they said, "Yes, yeah, that's bad as we've seen." So, <laughs> there's no way you're getting in a in a plane. Would you like to be ground crew? I said. No, I'm here to fly planes. So. Exactly. exactly. Uh, no, no, thank I'm you. Very <laughs> it's uh, um, cool. Um, you mentioned boots. Obviously, is your um, the, the the program you deferred when you went backpacking, and you spent a long time at, at, at boots for ten years or so. Or, um, yeah. Are you a retailer at heart? 
I wouldn't say I'm a retailer at heart. Um, look, the reason I went into Boots, it was at the time, it still is, it's, it's a great business. Yeah. It's a really great business. It was um, it's a great training ground. It's a UK icon. They had some you know, fantastic brands um, in the business. They had their own label, uh, which was you know one of the most trusted brands in, in the UK as well. Um, it was really people focused and it was, it was just the, the training and support that came with it was was just was just fantastic so i thought well you can't really go wrong in terms of you know going back 25 years or so ago you know how you get you build your careers um very growth orientated as well a lot of autonomy that they gave you early um in your career which was great so things like you know chris here's your budget for the next year got four weeks to come back in four weeks and tell me how you're going to hit your top and bottom line um stuff like that so that's actually quite unique i think mm -hmm. you know when you're three four years into your career to get that kind of stuff um you know am i a retailer at heart no not particularly but i, I do like retail i i had jobs in um like many others i'm sure in um when i was at college i worked in the bunnings equivalent over in the uk so sainsbury's home base and some fantastic green dungarees when i was at college <laughs> um, so i kind of knew a lot about retail or retail really so so it was kind of a natural fit to move into something like that and then learning more from a I guess a head office perspective. Um, two things I really liked about it, and two things I know about myself. I really like um, you know, the sport being working in teams and people. I just love working with people, first and foremost. Um, and then secondly, you know, I'm a bit of an analytical person as well. So, you know, retail is detail, as they say, as I was even ground into me when I was in my college jobs. And, and so, you know, you got into a lot of detail too. So it kind of played to those two, two elements as well. Great. And we've had <clears throat> close to 60 guests on, on, yeah. the, on the podcast for a So to explore a lot of I guess what we sort of call supplier side careers, uh, um, yeah. a lot in the consumer and FMCG space. But um, I, I'd love us just to unpick what does that first phase for you 10 years look like in terms of uh, a, a career in retail? Take, take us through the early years. How did you move through the business? So I guess the beauty of working on the retail side of things when you can go through these kind of different programs is that you essentially get exposure to every single function um, across, the, across the whole business. Um, in that first three or four years, which A, gives you grounding in what that function does and appreciation of that function. But then secondly, you got, you kind of get a really good flavor for, you know, what do you really like early in your career as well? What are the themes that you that you really like doing? So, for example, you know, I, in those first four years, I pretty much did seven or eight different jobs and it was crossing every single function. Oh. I did a supply chain role, I did a finance role, I did a marketing role, space management, sort of macro space management, how you, how you allocate that, merchandising. And then got into sort of like the product management side of things, product stroke category management at the time, it was product development, as well as the kind of more traditional buying function. Um, and I kind of landed on that because, you know, so the three, four years in, I wanted something which kind of gave me very portable, transferable skills. Because um, I kind of loved boots, but also I, loved, I knew from my, my backpacking days that whilst boots was an absolutely fantastic company, it was probably not a company I was necessarily going to stay with for life. Um, effectively yeah um so uh, so yeah that's kind of where where i landed uh, and that's the bit i liked it gave me lots of interaction with people internally as well as externally um obviously meeting suppliers and what have you so yeah it was uh, it was it was a really great great brand and then obviously through that you move through different roles and there's multiple different different roles you can do a little bit like um so probably like being in a coles or a woolies here in terms of the size of office and you know, three four thousand people and stuff so so yeah yeah, the huge organizations are, uh, yeah. and, and it's yeah. that, that kind of size often gives you the opportunity to try things that, you know, in a small business you just can't, can't do or, yeah. or in a very different way. But, yeah. um, and if I think, um, and, and you and I are, are old enough, obviously, because you we both lived through this, but in, in the kind of um, those mid-90s to, to mid-2000s, kind of a lot was changing really quickly in the marketplace. Data was becoming available for the first yeah. time and being manipulated and used and my recollection is that Boots was probably at the cutting edge of that with the um the Advantage card which was the, the, a big, the first big loyalty program I remember being mm -hmm. kind of I mean Tesco had their club card as, and so forth as, as, as well but um, did that kind of data loyalty you know a piece start to change your world even back then? Massively, oh, so absolutely massively, yes. Yeah. So I can't remember whether or not it was Boots came out first or Tesco. They were in the 12 months of each other, mm. about the late 90s. Um, but yeah, it did. So at, at the time, I was doing a role um, in the food area um, in, in Boots. So, you know, Boots, and for those of you who aren't aware of Boots, Boots has a, a sort of like a, a lunchtime offering, effectively a sandwich business. 
um, does very, very well in some of the smaller city areas, you know, London especially, very small stores. It's a footfall driver, essentially, was his purpose and role uh, within the business to try and bring, bring footfall in to then get the incremental purchase in, in the broader health and beauty space. Um, the, the boots, the boots, um, the boots sandwich offering, we tried multiple different promotions over a, a couple of years to try and get more people to buy them, buy X, get half price this, but a lot of them weren't sustainable. But then the advantage card data came out. So then what we could do is we go, well, what does this tool give us? Uh, we, we didn't really know until we started sort of um, understanding it 12 months in having lots of chocolate data. And, and essentially what we could do is start going into this big database and then start mining it to actually understand how customers shop. Um, who buys a sandwich and a drink of it in, in combination? Who just buys a sandwich? Who buys a sandwich and a packet of crisps or chips here? Who buys a sandwich and a chocolate bar? And you could start mapping that into sort of Venn diagrams and looking at a bullseye zone to say, right, okay, combinations of X, Y, Z. How do we then bundle something up into, into sort of a broader meal deal approach? What would the price be? How would we then go and you know present that in store um, from a customer perspective to, to create a need of shops and there'd be lots of negotiations going on with some of the big manufacturers to make sure that yeah, they got a disproportionate share of shops and make it easy to shop um, for, for some of those brands. And that was a phenomenal success. So we tested that in a couple of stores, got some feedback, saw actually what happened and can track and monitor that through the Advantage Card database to see what the average weight of purchase was and that was going up, frequency of visit was going up too. So it was those are the kind of metrics that it really opened up. And for the first time, um, it, it really kind of was a, was a material shift in the balance of power, because up until about that time, suppliers pretty much had it all. Mm. And then you kind of move over to the retailer mm. side, and now you've got the retailers having all this data. Um, and actually, it's a more granular level, um, which, which, which effectively means that the retailers have kind of have got more knowledge and data than suppliers for the first time. So... So that, that was a really interesting piece too, because you know we could validate some of the retailer, sort of some of the, some of the supplier assumptions against some of, some of our data. Yeah, um, I, I remember living in the UK at the time, and, and Boots meal deals were um, revolutionary uh, <laughs> for for the, your, your lunch time, and uh, and they were you sucking in all the data. Chris, little did I know at the time, and, and manipulating my kind of shopping behaviour and and uh, all the rest of it. But uh, fantastic. Could you stay at Boots forever? Is you know, is it that kind of business? Yeah, yeah, easily, easily stayed at Boots. There were so many different career pathways that you could go down. Um, you know, I, I actually moved out of the product management more into a marketing management role for for, for, a, for a lot of business development. Really moving into how Boots can expand financial services. A few of the other retailers were doing it. Um, so so launching new products in the financial services area, leveraging the power of the brand essentially. Um, but I I um I I kind of had a number of um bosses and fantastic bosses um who were there and then kind of there were restructures galore um within within boots every 12 18 months was a restructure um i'd always had this passion to travel and and being being inquisitive of what what, what was what was happening outside of boots i'd also had multiple multiple you know meetings with suppliers over a number of years so you know when, when you're on the supplier side you might have one or two meetings a month with the customer but when you're on the retailer side you you can have a, a year's worth of meetings in a, in a week yeah. effectively yeah. back to back to back meetings so you kind of get really you know entrenched in well what, what are the kind of you know what does a good meeting look like and i kind of looked at suppliers for a long time going oh, I, can, I can do that yeah yeah i wonder what it's like um so so i i i'd always been inquisitive on the supplier side and there was not yeah so i i just thought at some point I, i'm gonna have to jump out um if i want to sort of sat, scratch the itch yeah. um, how, did, how did you go about that how did you kind of make the move um, well, it's kind of a combination of a couple of things. When you've been somewhere for a long time and then there's restructures going on, there's a little bit of the selfish side of you that kind of goes, well, actually, I've been here a while. All these people are leaving. I just quite like to leave with a package if I could. Mm. I, was quite, I was quite fortunate. Um, there was a restructure going on. It was about the time I was, um, it was probably around about the zone. I've been there just shy of nine years. Um, it was coming up to that point. Uh, managed to exit with the package, went to the complete usual scenario that everybody does in their career. You go to what you know. Uh, even though I've had this inquisitiveness on the supplier side, I just went, oh, I guess, right, okay, there's a restructure coming up. I think it's going to happen this time. Well, I'm going to go apply for buying roles and other companies. So I left with a check in one hand and a job offer from Tesco and Asda in the other hand, went on holiday to Italy, had a week just chilling out on the beach in Italy. I actually thought, you know what, now I've just got to give this a give this a role. Um, so, um, so, so I actually... Um, kind of declined those two offers and thought, right, now's the time to cross to the dark side, so to speak. So it's started the job search and use that, use that opportunity to actually uh, to cross over effectively. Mm -hmm. And you, you worked at Brita 
in, initially before yes. you spent the first of two pretty chunky periods at J and J. I know uh, both business as well from the Australian yeah. point of view, but um, talk about the transition from retailer to to supplier. You must have had um, expectations about <laughs> what it was like. What, what was it kind of like? Yeah, what what you thought, or was it different? Different, yeah, definitely different. Um, I probably like a lot of people on the buying side kind of thought, well, these suppliers are just breeze in. They have a meeting with me a couple of times. Yeah, this must be straightforward. How hard can this be? Then they ring me up in the store on the way back and tell me one product's out of stock. That's not very helpful. Um, but um, um, no, it, it was very different. So, I mean, firstly, I went to a small, I've been in Boots for a long time. So I kind of figured, I've been a big company. I fancy doing something different. I'm going to a small company. That was probably a mistake, uh, I would say. So the transition from a, a big company into a small company for me, um, was was not great. I, you know, they they wanted to bring me in from a point of view of understanding the retail side. Um, I went straight into you know from being in boots to then managing the boots business. You know you think there'd be some advantages there because you know your way around, but actually the reality was is that the boots buyers who I who I, would deal, who I was dealing with, see many of them thought of me as a threat and made made a bit of a challenge because I know all the intricacies of how they go about doing yeah, things okay. and how they're going to fob me off and what have you. So I, I, I kind of knew what they were about and it actually made it really challenging, to be honest. Um, and the smaller business side of things as well, it meant you know, that there wasn't the, the breadth of people um, in that business to actually have support to lean on um, effectively. Um, so, so yeah, it was it was very different, you know, from from a you know, what do you take into that role? You have a absolutely you have an appreciation of what's important to the buyer. You know, you know, it's things like um, you know, how do you make your business, how do you make a component business case, you know, how do you make sure you keep open lines of communication, how do you make sure you get you get all these stuff back in a timely manner so you're not the one that they're chasing? You don't want to be that kind of supplier. Um, you know, equally. On the, on the supplier side, you know, you do have a little bit more time to look at some of the, you know, to, to dive into that category because you need to be the expert. You've got to find the time to do it too. Um, mm. So there's much more onus on you to drive drive the agenda, um, essentially. Uh, but yeah, it was, a, it, was a t- it was a tough start. And I think, you know, a couple of other things that probably surprised me, a lot more polarizing um, on, the, on the supplier side. Um, simple example for that would be um, a couple of years before, We've done these uh, boots and label internet auctions mm-hmm. um, for toothbrushes, for example. So when I was doing those on the buying side, it would be a case of I've got seven or eight suppliers. I'm trying to drive down the cost price um, of, of, of these toothbrushes. The challenge to me is I, I knew I was going to have a toothbrush business. I just didn't know what I was going to save and what cost it was going to be. Um, flip, flip that when you're into you know the the, the, the supplier side, and suddenly. It really is polarizing because you're either in or you're out. It's like putting everything on red 17 at the casino, basically. It's <laughs> what it feels like. Yeah. So, you know, as a result of that, there's going to be a lot more internal stakeholder management um, from, you know, to make sure that everybody's joined up with whatever the outcome is um, from, from the supplier side to make sure that if you get it, everybody's high fiving. But if you don't, because you want the number that are getting it, you you kind of um, at least everybody's like, you know, joined up in terms of why we didn't get it and where else we need to go um, beyond that. Um, so yeah, they're probably some of the some of the differences, similarities and differences. Great. And did you were you surrounded by people who could give you advice back then, Chris? Was there was there people giving you direction? Were you finding it all out yourself? I think it was there was a little bit. So there were a couple of my suppliers that, that kind of kind of got me inquisitive to start with a couple of suppliers who had made that transition yeah. who were kind of talking about how good it was once they'd settled in, but they'd gone into bigger businesses. Yeah. Um so I, I kind of got a couple of sound bites from them, but really it was it was really much a you know boot in straight in the deep end. Um, yeah. Essentially, I would say, um, yeah, that was, that was that was probably it would have been better if uh, in hindsight it would have been better if I'd have actually maybe sat down with those guys and said what were the challenges that you had, how you know how did you overcome those? Yeah, you know, did you find a did you know what what was the support network like in your business? What did you find the sort of things that worked um, for you? Right. It- the move from retail to supply, um, I want to talk about that from two perspectives. First of all, back then, mm. was that was that common what you did? You mentioned a couple of those had done it. Was it was it a flow of people moving between the two or was it more unusual? Describe it as a flow, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trickle? <laughs> yeah, it, it was more of a trickle. There were, obviously, the UK markets a little bit bigger than, than here. There, there were 
there were a few examples of it. You know, there was one guy in Boots who um, who was in Boots, went over to L'Oreal for a couple of years to get some supplies for then came back into Boots. Right. Um, you know, there were a couple of other suppliers who'd been working for a couple of the grocers who went into one of the big retailers, Colgate were actually the big retailer, the big supplier, sorry, who um, who took on a lot of ex-retailers. Um, but they, they were probably the best experience of it. But outside of that, no, most people were kind of linear going through either the supplier or either a retailer, I would say. Um, yeah, that would help would it be. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. yeah. and and when we kind of um uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll not jump forward, but uh, um I'm really I'm really keen to kind of talk about you know that in more detail. We'll come come back to that point, Chris. But um back to you and your career. So you moved to Australia what 2009 yeah. there thereabouts. Was yeah. that kind of um you know, a personal thing, was it professional, combination of both? It was it was very personal. Oh, it's a story it, here. It's very personal. <laughs> it was very personal. Um, no, look, when I when I was backpacking for what 10 years before, 10, 12 years before, um, as I said, I fell, fell in love with Australia, thought it's a great country, kind of really felt comfortable here. Um, also happened to um meet my wife here. She is not Australian, she is from England, which I remind her periodically that that's actually why I spent 10 years back in England uh, <laughs> after I finished backpacking. Um, but I'd, I'd wanted to come back, I'd always wanted to come back in a, you know, in a working capacity. So I, I, we actually applied for permanent residency visas probably about three or four years before. Um, they have a five-year validity. Um, and then things get in the way. We had, we had a, a couple of boys, I was finishing my MBA. And there was always something. We kind of got to the point where the, the visa was due to run out within six months. Um, and, and then I, I kind of thought, well, if we don't do it now, when the kids are young and they're kind of still portable, relatively mm -hmm. speaking, mm -hmm. it's just never going to happen. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'm kind of one of those people that kind of doesn't really want to get to 18 and go, well, what if I'd done that? You know, don't be a butt person. So, you know, give it a go. And if it works, then great. So obviously, first port of call, I was working for J&J &J at the time. Just, you know, I was with J&J. &J, I was from, from in, uh, through a Pfizer acquisition. Um, big global company, um, big reach as well, what happened at a transfer. So I, I kind of planted the seed with J&J &J probably around about the end of 2007, um, beginning of 2008, that this is what I want to do next, because they were trying to, um, they were offering me different roles, um, but they were all kind of London-based, and I didn't want to move down to London because they were very, very remote. remote. Um, came over in the middle of 2008, met the J&J &J crew, great. Yeah, we've got a job for you. We'll get it back something sorted for the beginning of 2009. Hedged my bets, met a, met a couple of retail uh, recruiters whilst I was here. Also kind of got, got some interest from another big company as well. So I thought, great, we're in here. Then got home thinking, right, the end of the year, the 2018 and 2009, we'll move over. Uh, GFC then happened, that little thing called the GFC. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, sorry, no intercompany transfers, Chris. So that was around about September 2008. So we just took the, took the decision to go, if we don't do it now, we just it, the visa won't land. We can't yeah. wait for the company. We'll just do it on our own. So actually, we just well, I quit my job and we just relocated ourselves at the beginning of two thousand and nine. Yeah. And then just sort of thought, well, let's give it a go. We rented the house out, um, landed here with a month's accommodation and no job. Um, at the middle of the GFC. In hindsight, not the smartest move, but actually, it was just a personal, very, very personal thing. Yeah, from and from a professional side of things. I think I got a little lucky, if I'm honest with you, um, in the sense that, you know, that 2008-2009 was when holes were going through that big change and the retail scene yes. was materially changing. If you go back that 15 years, basically there was an influx of homes coming in to run, run you know, grocery, um, essentially, um, and, and then bring a lot of those skills from the UK perspective in from a, from a retailer side, and then that was then trickling through to the supplier side as well. So I think the fact that I've been running the Tesco business for J&J, landing here with no job, I mean, that was why I had, you know, didn't find it too hard to find a role when I first got here, to be honest. So it's a little bit of the stars aligned in many respects. Mm. So I think the, the, the lesson in that is sometimes, you know, you've got to take a, if you, if you take a bit of a punt and back yourself, sometimes, you know, you don't know what can happen. It's quite ballsy though as well. And I, <laughs> and I do, I, I think there's a component of that when you look at how many you know, Brits or others who come from overseas to Australia, they do pretty well, mm. you know, and um, it's often this assumption, oh, you know, the Brits bring in different skill set, but then I've, I've um, worked uh, for a long time in the UK uh, with many Aussies and Kiwis who do brilliantly over there, and I wonder if it's just a, a, a mindset of, I'm going to put myself another end of the world, I'm going to, mm. I'm going to give it a fair crack. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think so. I don't. I don't think it's anything. There's, there's nothing better about being a Brit coming to no, Australia. There's no, nothing better about an Aussie being in, in Britain. It's the same essentially. Yeah. You know, all the opportunities are there for both of us. Um, yes, there was a timing bit, but at the same time, I think the the piece about people going from Australia to the UK or vice versa is when you make that move, you want to. You, you kind of you're all in. You want to make yeah. it. You want to make it work. So you, you also demonstrate the fact that you've got a degree of curiosity. You know, and you want to grow as a person by an experience, and then that, I think that translates into a role as well. Yeah. You know, and then you look at you know you, you talk about how do you recruit and what what sort of things do you recruit for that that curiosity growth mindset type thing is a really important part of it. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to it later, mm -hmm. but you know certainly from my side it is. I think yeah, then when when we're in this country, well, I'm here, I'm I'm on my own. I've got we've got family, immediate family. I, yeah, <laughs> we, we've got to make this work. Mm -hmm. It's got to work right. So um, so you, you have a kind of a fierce drive to to want to want to make it work. Yeah, uh, I think I think that's definitely yeah. Whether you're on your own or, or with family, yeah. it's, it, it, you, you're kind of still on your own a little bit. You're, you're like standing on your own too, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Now, I mentioned before, you, you had two students at J&J, so you did go back to J&J yes, um, after um, I was a cover, cover here. Yes. And, um, you know, that phrase, boomerang employee, um, not many people go back. It's, it's um, you know, for, for you, um, you know, was there something in, in particular that drew you back to J and J? Yeah, um, there was actually it was timing. Again, it was timing. I would say um, so. When I came over here, I obviously J and J hadn't, you know, unfortunately couldn't support me in that that transition and relocation here. But when I got here, I connected with them and then they offered me a role, and I was like, well, I don't think so. It wasn't the right type of role at the time, so I thought I'd take my chances and mix my world up and go for something else. So I went to a business called Alberto Culver. Um, had an absolutely brilliant time there. Another smaller business, very kind of entrepreneurial mindset type 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 place, and, and had a had a group of people there who were, were fantastic. Still in contact with all of them. Um, so really great small small business, and and you know we had a real change agenda at the time, so we kind of grew fairly significantly. Um, I'd like to say that we did such a great job. We got bought by Unilever, Little Old Australia, but obviously it's a bigger play. Um, yeah. We got bought by Unilever um, after a couple of years. Um, so there were, you know, I was looking at you know what opportunities I wanted to move into Unilever. There wasn't really anything there, but really through 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 networks, I got a, got a second bite at J and J. So J and J, I was introduced to um, um, uh, J and J by my kind of regional guy who used to work there, who said we were looking for a couple of people. Um, went and had a cup of coffee. Um, obviously, on the back of that recommendation and working for them in the UK, kind of thought I was lucky enough to get in um, it back into J and J. And the reason for going back is, I, I guess you know, boomeranging, yes, but a different country, um, b very different dynamics from a, from a business perspective. Um, the integration post Pfizer with J and J, which had happened in two thousand and seven, had been pretty seamless in the UK, and had been a little bit more clunky here. And there was a new management team that had gone in with a real view to sort of driving the turnaround um, with that J&J business at the time, going back 10, 10, 11 years ago. And as well as that, there was a huge amount of innovation coming as they were kind of really expanding the medicinal space by doing so, sort of like um, pharmacy to 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 to, on, to 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 grocery switches and lots of medicinal. So huge innovation pipeline too, as well as the people that were there who were, you know, there were a lot of things I was going to learn off those people as well. Mm -hmm. And your first step as sales director, getting to the the kind of the pointy end of your mm -hmm. career, Chris was with 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 Coty. Um, what was that step like? How did you make that happen? So it was it, again. It was it was it was really through 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 network. So so the ideal pathway is obviously to try and you know go in you know, make that step up in a business that you know is mm -hmm. is the preferred route. Um, unfortunately, you know that that transition was kind of it kind of stopped because there were some internal moves within J and J, which meant that I was probably another three years away. Um, and, and I kind of realised, well, it's probably now the time to to move outside. So I spent a bit of time looking looking around. So what's the easiest transition, or what's the best kind of transition with the skills I've got? I knew the health and beauty category pretty well. Um, so it felt like a health and beauty category uh, role if, if something came up. And then this Coty one came up through, like I heard about through through, through a colleague um, and kind of went through that process. And it was a really great fit because I knew some of the new categories that they were going into, which are hair care, which linked back to the Alberto Culver experience. And then there were obviously some new health and beauty categories that they already had, like cosmetics and fragrance, which are very different. So, and it was a more mid-tier mid business as well, uh, a very autonomous type of business. Um, so 
that also really appealed to me at the time. Yeah, right. And you're in your second kind of sale director role, Chris, with, with Hasbro now. Um, so two very different sorts of mm. businesses. Um, is, is the role essentially the same or is it is it quite a different role? Uh, very, yes and no. Mm. Yes and no would be would be the answer, to be honest. Um, yes, in the sense that there's a lot of core principles that are the same, you know, things like leading the team, setting the direction, um, you know, be working with them as part of a broader leadership team. Um, making sure you've got the right customer engagement touch points from a you know senior level, um, making sure that you're focused in on all the, the core KPIs and deliveries of the KPI, whether that be you know obviously share profit, uh, sales, etc. Um, that that will be similar, but then there's a lot of differences too. Um, you know, different different type of business. It's always it's not health and beauty. Yeah, but there are a lot of bit lot of lot of um, differences that come with that, and that's part of the reason I wanted to go into that area to sort of test myself in the case you know four skills. But then adjacent category, what are the things that you can go and learn in a different environment? So, you know, J and J is um sorry, sorry, um Hasbro is 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 different because we're you know the, the channels that, that we're playing in are more kind of mass, um, mass econ, that that kind of space versus maybe more traditional grocery and pharmacy areas. So, you know, that's a big part of the business. But then you've also got specialty toy, toy money. I've never dealt with those guys before. Yeah. Um and it was also another side of the business like which we deal with uh, more fan collectible side of things and things like the ev games and you know, jb hi-fi and all of that kind of stuff so that was really interesting massively different supply routes routes to market so you've got domestic you've got you know fob you've got lead times which are significantly different from right. e even multinational um fmcg manufacturers who manufacture things outside and then you're talking about talent cycle of six to nine months in toys um, so, which are you know materially different from maybe three three months four months in maybe a lot of other businesses. So, um, so yeah, so they're probably the differences. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of the core kind of traits from a leadership perspective. Well, you know, what direction are we going in? How do you then you know empower the team and and, and lead the team mm -hmm. to to mm -hmm. deliver the overall objectives of the business whilst you're getting your head around some of the differences, which is the learning curve. Yeah. And, and it's toys or grits, right? So. Is is it what's it, not to like? Is it, toys? Yeah, is it as much fun as it sounds it could be? Um, yeah, it is actually. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it can also be. I mean, it's a, it's a we 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 say in Hasbro it's a complex business. Boys are a complex business. I was told it's a complex business before I started in what three and a half years ago. Yeah, and as I like to remind the guy who hired me, who now is over in the US, he said, "Boy, you ever told me about COVID?" <laughs> Which is like a whole level, a yeah. different degree yeah. of um, of complexity. But yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a huge portfolio of brands. So very very similar to J and J, huge portfolio of brands. But so how do you prioritize those brands? You know, how do you make sure that you're really focusing on those that are really going to make a meaningful difference, rather than just kind of like you know two or three products on a very small brand, which might not be very profitable, might not really turn the dial so much. Yeah. So how do you just galvanize the business around around those priorities really? And I guess unlike um, more traditional like FMCG, where the, the the brands perhaps evolve. <clears throat> Um, steadily, uh, it, it might, I'm assuming there's a component within Hasbro and the, and the industry of, of fashion and trend and, and one year something's really big, the next year it might not be. Yeah, it's the, 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 way, the way it's kind of positioned is more um, from an internal Hasbro perspective, it's very much like fast fashion is what they say. Okay. So you think about traditional FMCG, it's probably 10 to 15 percent innovation every year, you know, and then when you look, you can really be single minded and focused on a launch. You know, it's, it's more than double that in, in toys, oh. you know, and, and it can be, you know, you can be in and out very quickly. So a retailer won't give you three or six months to see whether your product's going to work and you've got lots of time. They'll, they'll probably, you know, they might give you four weeks, <laughs> maybe six weeks, if I should say this works or it doesn't work. So actually, you know, getting out, getting that product out there quickly is important. You also have a lot more failure in innovation by the very nature of innovation, right? Not everything works. So, you know, there's a large, large amount of products that don't work, but then the ones that do work, how do you make them really work so you can get a big bang for your buck? So that innovation piece is really important. It also leads to, well, how do you then manage all your, your inventory um, when things don't work? How do you create way to create that through? What's the channel play for that? So different levels of complexity yeah. um, involved in that business, for sure. We talked about data earlier on and, and yeah. um, back in boost days. I imagine that's something that you, you, you will guide you a lot more and, and um, which means you can make those decisions quite quickly based on performance, either from a commercial or consumer yeah. perspective. Yeah, yeah. Now this, 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 we've got plenty of data in the business. Yeah. Um, 
I think it's more about just making sure we've got the right data in the right places. We, we went into some of the chopper data here as well now, which is which is good. So we're getting some insights to support you know some of those launches and where they where they fit and the, the size of the opportunity, etc. Um, so yeah, but we have plenty of data in the business to make those make those decisions for sure. Okay. Back to your role as a leader, Chris. So yeah. um, one of the things we discuss a lot when we're working with our clients is how, how does the business articulate its vision? How do they connect people to what they're trying to achieve at an enterprise level? Yeah. Now, for you as a sales director, how do you do that? What Have you got a tool, a methodology you use? How do you can ensure that people understand how they contribute? I think it's a, it can be a tough one, um, I, I, would, I would say. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's definitely not always the easiest thing. I think the consistency and communication are probably the key themes that come through on this one, to be honest. Um, you know, and I think it also depends on the type of business that you're in as well. Um, if you're in a, you know, global top-down business um, or if you're in a local business. So, so two different two different routes. Um, but effectively, you know, once you've got, what you need to first of all articulate what are, what are you trying to achieve and then i guess whether it's global or local how does that then link in with the with the mothership mm -hmm. um when you've got that you know local execution plan or strategy how you then communicate that to the team is is, is, is really key and being literally relentless in how you talk to it so everybody's talking those top three or four priorities and trying to keep it very simple so that everybody understands it in very small sound bites is, is, is critical and then how you then measure that too is important. Um, so, you know, we've done a lot of work in, in the business. I've been similar to other businesses. You know, goals are super important within that too. You know, what get measured, what gets measured gets done. That old chestnut does come out. And it's really true because I think it's, you know, if you if you know what you're doing and have it have it articulated on one page, um, everybody's clear. All of those align, all those goals for an individual are then lined up to the overall objective of your your, your business. And then it becomes clear for an individual to say, well, I know my role uh, and my contribution towards the broader organizational uh, piece, whether that means you're on a growth brand or a growth customer or a, or a you know a customer that we just want to maintain or a brand that we just want to maintain, they each have a role to play and they're all really important. Mm -hmm. Question from the chat, which I'll just jumping back to the your mm -hmm. UK and Australia, um, Chris from Dominic Lee. Um, <clears throat> there was, uh, what was the biggest change going from the UK market to the Australian market. Are there any strange nuances? I like the word strange nuances <laughs> that you had to manage and what recommendations would you provide someone wanting a more global career? Good question. Good morning, Dom. Um, um nuances look at yes there are nuances I, off the top of my head I probably couldn't think of anything specific uh, but I will give an example from the Alberto days and Dom Dom I don't know whether he was there at the time. There was a, um, I think it comes down to mindset and approach and how you deal with those nuances. So, you know, simple thing could be around promotional programs. One thing that really struck me when I got here was that, oh my goodness me, we've got holes and walls to do weekly promotions. I mean, what is going on? This is crazy. How complex is this? Um, in the UK, we were doing four week promotions, so like 12 promotional slots a year, 13 promotional slots a year, you've got 52. Um, you can't you can't have your, your Woolies and your Coles clashing, for example. Why not? That's, oh, why, why can't you do that? I <laughs> know oh, you don't want the phone call, Chris. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think the um, I think from a mindset perspective, for for, for for me, one thing that I learned pretty quickly was to not necessarily judge. Um, and, and the phrase that that we, we came up with, that some of these, and my wife and I was, it's not right or wrong, it's just different. You know, so I think when you're going from one country to another. There's a certain degree of understanding uh, that you need to do and be respectful of the environment that you're in. And then when you feel like you, you know, okay, you know a little bit about it, then what are the things that you can add um, from, a, from a build? You know, because you do have experiences and different experiences from, from different markets. And there are things that you can add, can add in that will add value um, in, in an organization, or at least you hope they will. Very well said. Nothing worse. And, and uh, I've been on both sides of the fence here when, when um, well, the Brits were here or, or, or the Aussies, Aussies in, in, in the UK talk about how much better it is back, you know, in their own country and why is it not done the same? And as you probably say, hey, it's not better or worse, it's just different. It's different. Yeah, it's and different. And if you don't like it, as, as, as one of one of my team very aptly put to me, um, I've been here about six months when I was moaning about the price of a Mars bar and it was like on half, one of those half price <laughs> deals, which made it probably more in line with the UK. But obviously, there's a different cocoa content. I said it, it still was questionable taste, even though the price was okay. He just looked at me and went, mate, 
the airport's that way. There's no locks on the door. You can leave whenever you like. I'm like, okay. <laughs> There's no locks in the door. Yeah, that's exactly. That's so I think it's about choice, right? So yeah. you've got to have that open, open mind, uh, open mindset. Great. Um, conscious of time, but uh, a few other things I want to get yeah. through as well. But uh, um, um, when I, I'm, I'm always interested in talking to to leaders, Chris, and you, you've been in the senior leadership role for a while now, and and um, when you're bringing in talent, you yeah. know, so looking through the recruitment lens, um, you know, I, I get that you know skills, and experience vary by mm -hmm. my role, but are the common traits that you see when you're recruiting for, you think actually that's the sort of thing I'm always after, something innate about that person that mm. I know is going to work well with me or my business, my team. Yeah, yeah, and that's it's a really good question, Mike. Um, yeah, look, there's, there's probably two or three things I say. Firstly, it's always great when you see a candidate who is really prepared um, for an interview. So, you know, they show an interest in the role. You know, when, when you're going through um, maybe some more generic questions, you know, it's not many, it's maybe four or five or what have you. You know, what are the examples that, you know, worked? What things have they overcome? What are their key stories? You know, but equally be as succinct as you can. And I, I know sometimes that's that's something I sometimes struggle with. Um, second one then is around, you know, what's what's your interest in the role? Um, you know, what research have you done? Um, you know, you, you, the, the ones that kind of stand out are the ones that come in and go, oh, I've been out in the store and I saw this great execution on your brand. Tell me, do you do those often? How many of those does that work? Is that a really effective one? Um, or this this was done by a competitor. The ones that don't stick, are, and this has happened many times, more, more times than I can remember, is when, when you ask them what their favorite brand is and they <laughs> mention the competitors. <laughs> so I have actually, even at Hasbro, I've gone, oh yeah, well, so what's your favorite brand? I've got Barbie. I'm like, that's Mattel's. So that's not that's not ideal. Uh, but then the other things as well is um, you yeah, know, just I think it's this this trying to try to underpin this well. Whether it be professionally or personally, what are the stories that the individuals got, and how, are they exuding a degree of curiosity um, and, and, and you know a willingness to learn and and, and, and grow, etc., um, and not just looking for the next job? You know, and what what do they see? What do they see as their career path? What do I do in three or five years? You know, I love someone turning up with a review to say, looking, you know, where does this job lead to? That's a really great question back. You know, rather than just oh, it's this job. You know, the, the more times you hear that in a candidate, the better, because it shows they've got their own, you know, I guess, um, plan for themselves. Um, and, and that's really, that kind of just shows a degree of ambition and actually sort of curiosity as well, saying, look, I'd like to do this, but I know I need to do this to address some of the issues that I, or challenges or development areas that I've got now. Um, how, do, you know, and this role would, would deliver that and buy. Yeah, yeah um, I agree with all of that. I think, I think, um... Uh, we cover actually uh, pretty much all that, Chris, and more in our interview guides, which we produce for for anybody who's who's uh, either preparing for an internal move in their business or they're moving externally, whether through us or through any other means. Guys, those guides are gold. So please reach out to one of the XR consultants, and you can get um, pretty much everything Chris has said um, and, and a bit more in there. But um, cool, um, Chris, if, if you were to kind of sum up and try and give three pieces of advice mm -hmm. to someone in their early to mid career yeah. looking at you and your role and thinking, I, I think I would love to be a sales director or a senior leader of, yeah. of some sort. What advice would you give them? I would say um, early in your career, learn what you like and learn what you're good at as well. Um, you know, focus on building your skills and knowledge and experience. Um, you know, and use your network to to really you know test yourself to actually understand what else is out there because often you don't know um, until you do speak to other people who are different about doing different roles. Um, and and the other piece would say you know be really open minded, be curious. Um, you know want to explore, want to do different things, want to take yourself out of your comfort zone. You know, you know if you're just in sales, you know the, the really great salespeople are the, the more rounded ones and certainly ones that I've seen and and have been either been in my teams or been in different businesses. That have done really well and been promoted and doing you know similar jobs to me now they're the ones that have actually got broad cross-functional experience and they've got it early in their career so whilst it can sometimes be a little bit of a oh okay well i'll go sideways and i'll do this for 18 months and then you go well maybe i can get the next job and the next pay rise now you know it's not always about the right the pay rise now because actually what you're doing is you're laying, laying some really broad solid foundations for your for your career later on which will absolutely pay back um, so I know that's what's kind of happened to me. I wouldn't necessarily say it was a huge plan early in my career when I got that broad cross-functional experience.
but it's certainly paying off, you know, now having that sort of first three, four years with that breadth that I got. And people who've done, you know, from the sales to the category of sales to marketing, you know, I've, I've even had people in, in my previous teams who've moved into finance from sales and then come back again. You know, that's, that's, that's fantastic. You know, that just creates a whole different, you know, mindset and, and perspective that that person brings to the role. Um, and, and those people will like, generally, not always, but generally, they'll set themselves up for long term success. Great, great advice. Um, and you, Chris, what's next? Where do you, where do you go? Oh, well, um, look, I'm, I'm really enjoying the role I've got now at Hasbro. So, you know, carry on learning um, in the role I've got now. You know, longer term, um, be great if there was a, a broader role within Hasbro or alternatively, if there's not, then, you know, a different growth orientated business further down the track. But, but yeah, I, I, you know, toys are a great business. So, yeah. very, very much enjoying it at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So, general manager and Beckham's done the line in the sounds of it at some point. And, and the last question um, is where we started, which was yeah. the, the, this uh, lack of talent flow between retail yeah. and supply. Now, we've managed to facilitate a few moves in the last year from retail to supplier side, which is great. And and, um, and I think the more the better, but you yeah. know, how, do we, how do we open people's minds to this? Yeah, well, I think probably a couple of things. Um, from a business perspective, I think businesses need to be open for this a little bit more. Too often businesses recruit for have you done a national account manager job before? Um, where have you done it? And it's a little bit too vanilla, quite frankly. Um, you know, how can that business kind of bring in a different perspective of what the retail or supplier side is? Um, and, and really kind of, I guess there's a learning opportunity for them as an organization in those smaller teams, really. Um, um, so, so I think that businesses need to be open first and foremost. Secondly, um, I would say from an individual perspective, perspective as well, um, you know, you need, we need more people to have that curiosity uh, and, and, and you know, a willingness to want to, to, to try something different and say, I wonder what it is like on the other side, a little bit like I do in a way right back at the start to go, I've seen all these guys, some of them are brilliant and some of them aren't, but what defines good? You know, and everybody will have their own definition of what defines good. Um, you know, I think that's especially important to build a career pathways that we can have when, you know, you look at broader sort of FMCG now, and there's you know a lot of, a lot of the, 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 the younger people now wants to go into new tech tech areas, right? So how do we make sure there's there's, there's real breadth of career pathways between the two? And lastly, I'd probably say from a personal perspective with the experience I had, I would say if you're going to do that move and you want to do that move, make sure you pick a business um, on either side which has got um, the breadth, the the skills, the capability, the people in it. That are going to support you. So, is there somebody in that business that could be a buddy? So, I, I know I really learned more when I moved away from Britter after that 12, 15 months and went straight into Pfizer because I realized, realized I needed something which was going to have more like minded people who a couple of people in that business had done the change. They could help and coach and manage and provide advice. So, I'd probably say it's a combination of those two things, mate. Excellent. Well, I'll, uh, I'll be aiming to put, um, you know, some more retailers on my shortlist. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, the team will be this year, so watch out. Uh, and if there's any retail listening, then get in touch. We'd love to try and uh, help you go that way and, and uh, perhaps other ways as well. So um, fantastic. Great advice, Chris. Really enjoyed the conversation. Some excellent uh, content in, in there. Hopefully the technology held up. It was making all sorts of noise. But I uh, hope uh, um, we, we, we can get the audio right for, for podcasts. And thanks for speaking with us on the live session, guys. Now, um, our mission at AXR Recruitment Search is to help you make great career decisions and, and, and to understand your, your pathways. If you're not yet connected to the team here and you're looking for just some, some understanding of what career goals could look like, then please reach out uh, to have a conversation. There's lots of ways we can also help you, so, as well as just uh, defining those pathways. We've got our 2023 salary guys, which are out. They are going phenomenally well. I can't believe the number of downloads there. Um, recruitment guides, I mentioned earlier on, on how to get yourself into your fit, a whole bunch of things there monthly mail shot on who's moved where, which is really good to just understand what 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 moves are other people making beyond just the ordinary. So we try and package up the really interesting ones that we're involved with. Uh, um, we're back on again next week. So only a one week gap. Um, another live session with an industry superstar, not that you are, Chris, so another, <laughs> another superstar, uh, Sue Temple, who is managing director of an organization taking the loyalty market by storm, L founders of loyalty, a business where we're enjoying working with uh, and um, if you can't make live sessions don't worry uh, make sure you subscribe to our podcast your future in sales and marketing available on spotify 
Google and Apple Podcasts, where you can access over 50 leadership journeys and lots of cool bonus pods. So thanks again, Chris. Pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and for me, Mike Dixon, have a great day.